Welcome to this conversation on how we speak about science and what makes us listen to science and how can we become better science communicators. My name is Jan Rockström. I'm a professor in Earth System Science at the Potsdam University and the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. The original plan was for me to hold a performance lecture, our brief moment on Earth, at the Royal Dramatic Theatre in Sweden, followed by this conversation. But obviously, COVID-19 has put a stop to that. And uh, the performance lecture was instead recorded by Swedish television and is now at the Nobel website. And you will also find it on the Swedish television SVT Play homepage. You are welcome to look at the performance lecture as a stage setting prior to this conversation, or of course, at any time of your preference. Because also our conversation now will be a recorded event. The theme of our discussion is how to communicate science. To talk about this, I have invited two eminent guests. Sir Richard Roberts, Nobel Laureate in Medicine, 1993, with extensive experience of communicating science and engaging on work with human rights. Great to have you with us, Rich. Nice to be here, thank you. And on my other side, Anna Sjöström Duagi, initiator of the performance lecture series in collaboration with Dramaten and the Nobel Prize Museum, and who is now working with a large international collaboration, the so-called Nobel Prize Summit, the first one ever, with the purpose of raising the role of science and the latest scientific insights to both policymakers and a global audience. It's great to have you with us, Anna. Thank you so much, Johan. Very nice to be here. Great. So everyone, warmly welcome. And to kick this off, let me just give you a little bit of framing. Just a few words then about this year's performance lecture, our a brief moment on Earth. At the core, uh, I came to this as a scientist based on, on the drama that scientific evidence is pointing to. I mean, not only are we facing, we have unequivocal evidence of this, real risks of destabilizing life support systems on Earth, in fact, the entire planet. We are at risk of uh, handing over a planet which is less able to support all future generations of humans on Earth. We increasingly know that our last chance of acting as a world community is now. We've entered what may be the most decisive decade of humanity's future on Earth. This is our chance to avoid crossing tipping points that can lead to irreversible changes. And at the same time that we know about all these potentially disastrous risks, we have more and more evidence of global transformations to a sustainable, prosperous and equitable future, which are not only necessary, but we have the evidence that they are possible to introduce, the, the solutions are available, and they give generally tremendous win-win benefits for all people. So a safe landing zone for humans on Earth is at our reach, but the window is rapidly closing. I mean, a script made for an action movie, perfect for, so to say, a drama. The lecture at the Dramaten then intertwines the 10 scientific shock messages, both positive and negative, with my dialogue with a young mother and her young family and the journey that she makes when she receives more and more of the scientific communication in a dialogue that I have with her and her young family. And the journey she makes as a mother, the marvelous actor Sana Sundqvist, from you know day-to-day -day ignorance, levels of denial, all the way to uprising and frantic action to, to save humanity on Earth. And this was indeed a very unusual way for an academic like me to communicate. I think it reaches closer to the heart of people, or at least I wish it does so, but it was definitely a challenge. So, Anna, it was all your fault. You are the initiator of the performance lectures of this format to put scientists out there in the deep end of the pool in a very uncomfortable situation. What did you think? What did you like about this format and what are you trying to accomplish? Thank you, Joan, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And I must say, ev blame everything on me. I had the <laughs> fantastic job to 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 work with uh, people like like you and and Johan. You are really ins an inspiration of all the things that you are doing. 
all the time to to communicate out the the, the science behind the climate situation and and also for, for rich the everything that you are doing it's 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 really a privilege to do this so so my my job is to develop new nobel prize programs and um, it's it's a really a pleasure having this toolkit to work with uh, Work, working with the developing Nobel Prize programs, uh, it's also a great, uh, you have great resources because you can talk about the fantastic discoveries being made by the laureates and you can talk about the inspirational stories behind the laureates work and, and you are awarded Rich because you have made uh, something that was of greatest benefit to humankind. And many of you laureates are witnessing uh, about um, breaking paradigms and that you are also working against uh, a, a common belief and that you have, some of you have to work against your peers, which is a very challenging uh, situation. Uh, and also that you have to think in new ways, uh, you have to be creative, you have to find the pleasure and joy to work uh, if maybe someone, no one in the world believes you maybe. And, and that is also uh, to, to say that the, the, the role of science and, and needs to be uh, a passionate and, and a nice and interesting way in order for you to keep on working. Uh, so working with the Nobel Prize program is, is really um, a fantastic way of trying to spread the legacy of Alfred Nobel of that science, uh, peace and literature has made the world a better place and will continue to do so. Uh, and, and that is also something that we say sometimes that the problems of today will be solved by the laureates of tomorrow. And that's very a nice, also a very nice fit uh, of this, uh, the issue that we are having on the performance lecture and, and the reason why I so much wanted you, Johan, to make this performance lecture because you are constantly working to, to reach out with the message that we are, as you already said, we are standing in a time in history that we need to do and make actions in order to change the path that we have gone into. And there are many, many decisions for policymakers that are uncomfortable to take, which means that they need to be informed and everyone needs to be informed also to support these political decisions. So that is about saving humanity. And I can't think about anything else that was so much aligned with the will of Alfred Nobel than to do the greatest benefit of humankind. So that was the long answer of why I wanted you to do this performance lecture. And, and the reason why the, we started the collaboration between the Nobel Prize Museum and the Royal Dramatic Theatre was that we, we were thinking about how to reach out to people that maybe normally doesn't go to a webinar, listening to a scientific presentation, uh, maybe go to the theater. As you said, Johan, it was an evening activity. Maybe you go with your adult kids, you get inspired, you get engaged, you get new ideas and you get curious. And maybe then you go home, you talk about this at the table, you try to find literature or more information. And so this is like being a seed of curiosity that makes you want to continue knowing more. And then of course, using the most wonderful tools that the, the researchers like Johan, that can mediate it together with the tools of the, the theater. So that was really the, the, the reason why we tried this. And we tried with one about robotics. And then now we have, I think your is the sixth one in the series. And we, to our great satisfaction, they have been very popular and, and people are coming to see the shows. So um, it's, it's an interesting uh, way of reaching out with, with information and, uh, and just as a seed of information. So now I will ask you, Rich, um, uh, who, who is this uh, awarded for being this super uh, curious and interested person and, uh, and also if you had the chance to see the performance, what did you think? And also, um, what do you think about this uh, meeting between science and, and art or different tools in, in communicating? Well, I, I did see the performance and um, to be honest, when it first got started, I thought it was rather boring, but as it warmed, as it moved along, it didn't take too long, but as it moved along, I found it more and more engaging all the time. And I thought the acting was particularly well done, especially the mother. Um, she really came across as in, in a very realistic way. 
and the fact that she underwent this evolution from really not giving a damn about climate to actually deciding that this was something that she was really going to be very active about, I thought was terrific. I don't know how they managed to keep the baby quiet at the appropriate times, but um, <laughs> perhaps that is some theatrical trick. But overall, I thought it was very good. Um, I, I very much like the idea of blending this kind of visual and audible presentations in a way to communicate science that is not usually done. And I think it will be interesting to see how far that goes. One could imagine doing a series of shorter versions that might be good. Um, you know, one of the problems is that when you look at something on a screen, um, if you get bored, you just switch it off. And I, I think with the advent of social media and everything that's going on at the moment, people's attention span tends not to be so much. So if you're in a theater, it's easy because, you know, you're stuck in your seat and people don't walk out in the middle of a performance. But when you're doing something that is being viewed on television or is being viewed on the web, um, I think one has to find a way to make sure that people stay engaged. Um, but that's up to our theatrical colleagues, I think, to figure out how to do that. I'm not sure we as scientists are necessarily the best, although there are some who, who I think have done a very good job. Um, people like David Attenborough, who runs these nature shows. Um, I imagine he could actually do something on climate change that would be very useful. Or Neil deGrasse Tyson, who does mm -hmm. these shows and, and is really very charismatic and good. Unfortunately, Carl Sagan, who used to be excellent in this field, um, passed away. But I, I think there are people out there who do a very, very good job. And I thought Johan did an excellent job in terms of, you know, getting everything going. So <laughs> Thank, I would thanks, also Richard. say I, I'm, I'm really pleased that the Nobel Foundation has decided that they're going to go this way and take advantage of the laureates in order to spread good scientific messages. I, I think when I first won the prize, there was a reluctance of the foundation to get involved in this. And I, I think it's a very, very good idea. You know, one of the things we as Nobel laureates have is great love for the Nobel Foundation, uh, because the week we spend in Stockholm to pick up the prize is something none of us will ever forget. And it's very easy if you ask us to do something, our natural reaction is to say, well, can we do more? And mm -hmm. so I think you should take advantage of this. This is a very good thing. And that's that's very nice to hear. And, and it's also nice to hear from you, Rich. Uh, what, 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 was, what would you say is the difference as you as a researcher before getting the Nobel Prize and, and after? Is it different or do you, do you, do you talking about science communication? Is it easier for you to talk about science or get heard after you got the Nobel Prize or or do you get more afraid to talk? It could be both both ways. Well, you know, before I won the prize, I was I've always been a bit of an activist all my life. So, you know, I, I tend to say what I think and what I feel and try to convince other people of it. And before I won the prize, you know, people would listen or pretend to listen, but it was very rare that they would actually do anything. Uh, but I found that since I won the prize, people tend to listen much more closely and in some cases even follow through with action. So there's no doubt it does give you a platform um, from which you can speak and from which you can hope that people will listen. So, for instance, I've met many politicians um, since I won the prize, people who I would never, ever have been able to talk to and meet beforehand. And so I usually try to take those opportunities to um, spread some science into politics, because I think there's no doubt we need a lot more science in politics. No, that is a, a really good good point, Rich. And that actually takes takes us, I think, to, to the first topic I, I would suggest us to, to dwell into, and that is the, the role of science communication and how important it is. I mean, we scientists, can build careers on, on publishing peer-reviewed papers and advancing our science. But the question is, what responsibility do we also have as, as taking that, that evidence towards or, or across the bridge of communication with policymakers and communities and business leaders? What, what role does, do scientists play? And I think the, the COVID-19 crisis has, has really 
you know, shown uh, in, in a very, very significant way the importance of scientific evidence and, and the role of understanding. I mean, I think uh, the, the word peer review is suddenly understood <laughs> in much, much wider uh, stratas of, of society than, than ever before, basically. And then what, what are your thoughts there, Rich? What can we learn from COVID-19 in terms of science communication? Well, I think I've always felt that communicating with other people was very important. And I think many scientists feel that they can only um, show how expert they are by using language that the general public or politicians don't understand. Mm. And somehow this elevates them, um, at least among their peers, because they can use acronyms and they can use fancy terms to describe things which don't yeah. necessarily make it um, to the general public. And I think it, it is an art to learn how to communicate effectively. And in my view, I think it's something that we should teach in school. Um, I, I think kids who want to head into science or any subject should learn how to communicate with people. You know, the first act of communication that's important is when you go looking for a job. And it's really important to be able to convince the person um, that you're talking to that they should hire you. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is something that easily can be taught. And so I, I'm very much in favor of teaching people to speak in language that is clear, um, even in scientific papers. Some of the very best papers have very simple and straightforward language um, that someone in another field can understand. But so many scientists feel they have to use um, these specialized terms in order to communicate effectively. And I think it's not true. I, I have something that I call the grandmother test that I give to students. And, and I tell students, you know, in order to learn how to communicate, you need to be able to tell your grandmother exactly what you do on the lab bench every day and explain it in words that she can understand. And the test mm. of whether she's understood it is whether she can then go and boast to all of her friends, what a very smart grandchild she has, and explain what you do. And for me, I think this is, this is really crucial. And it's actually fairly easy to learn once you realize that you're talking to someone who is, you know, you know well, but they're not a scientist and they don't understand necessarily everything. And so you, you explain in words that they can understand. And it's much like when they were teaching you to speak, um, they did the same kind of thing. They, they taught in language that you would understand, not necessarily that an adult would. No, but I think I think that that's really well taken, uh, Rich. But but I wonder, I mean, there's one additional dimension that, that I get confronted with a lot. And I know what, what your advice here is, Anna, because it's one thing to avoid kind of uh, scientific jargon. I totally agree. But there's another thing that science is always associated with with uncertainties and uh, you can never be so precise and it's uh, it's kind of an inherent part of the scientific inquiry and um how how and and we academics generally get accused of you know can you never answer yes or no on a question god damn it <laughs> and then often we can't so I mean, you, you must be colliding with that all the time on uh, dealing with Nobel laureates all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I mean, yes, that is a really tricky question. And I, and I think that has been really in the spotlight of the COVID-19 crisis because there the, the scientific data has evolved in real time in public, exactly. which is rare. I mean, normally Nobel laureates get awarded for, for a discovery that has been way in the past because then it, that's the scientific method. It takes time. It takes time to prove that it's not true. So that is like the whole beauty of the scientific method in academia is, is to cherish the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that is the opposite of what a policymaker or a general audience or the media would like to have. As you say, goddamn, can you just say yes or no? Don't come with this. It's 95% possible or maybe, but you can't be 100% sure. Uh, and I think that is really a challenge. And, and I think that is also a lot of the debate that has been around the, the corona strategy. The, uh, the, like what you, in, you said that you thought this, but now it's like this. You scientists, you don't agree. How should we believe and how should I be sure to take the vaccine if you then go further? Because you want to know that if not the scientific 
uh, society are unified, then how can you trust this? And I think that is a very big challenge uh, in, in, in the topic that we're talking about today. That was like, like the whole year that we passed now was like a big test of mm. how, how do policymakers, uh, the general audience, the media relate to the scientific process in, that is built on uh, more and more evidence building up like a puzzle and, and, and in the beginning of the coronavirus, there was no, not so many pieces of this puzzle there. So the image was starting and some of the images got wrong, but then it was more pieces and it, the, the, the picture got more and more um, sure. And now we have tons of evidence about how the coronavirus looks like, how it works, how it spread. But there are still a lot of things that are not known. And that is like, then you can always say that, oh, there are so many things we don't know. But you can also say that there are so many things we know now. So mm. I think, I mean, this is such a challenge. And, and for me, working with, uh, I have now been was, uh, working with this, like, how do you, the, the interface between science and, and policymakers, the interface between scientists and, and, and like general audience, I think that is, something that I struggle with still every day. And I, and I really think that the last year was interesting in terms of this. I don't know what you say, Rich, because I mean, this, this, this COVID and also the scientific process relating also to the fact of that a disease that is coming close to you, us, maybe your family, comparing them to the climate situation, that is something that maybe in the future will affect. I don't know if it's, I don't know how, what you think. Well, my feeling is that the countries that did best in the COVID crisis are those where the politicians really recognized that the scientists were the people who needed to do the communication and not them. Mm. And I think this has been very apparent in a number of countries in New Zealand, um, where Jacinda Ardern immediately looked to the science and said, you know, what can you tell us and we will do what, what you say is best for us. And New Zealand did incredibly well. I think Jacinda, is, it, she is an amazing lady and an ideal politician as far as I'm concerned, because she does listen to expert advice. Taiwan, South Korea, they did the same. But, but unfortunately, the pardon? Yeah, I'm just thinking if the, if the scientific community doesn't say the same message, well, but I think the scientific community did more or less say the same message. It was just it got polluted and diverted by politicians like Trump, who really kept speaking over the scientists and giving his version of what was going on without listening to the science. And I think people slowly recognized that that was a problem, which is why Dr. Fauci became so popular because people tended to listen to him. He was a very straight talker. He didn't try to um, cloud over issues. And in press conferences, you know, he would rub his eyes if Trump was saying something foolish, um, which was happening far too often. But, but I, I think there is the possibility, and COVID is a very good example, where science not only was communicated quite well by some people, like, like Tony Fauci, um, and very badly by the politicians for the most part. It's an example of something where the, the benefits of science, the value of science really came through enormously well. Um, you know, within a year of this terrible pandemic starting, we had excellent testing available. Um, not all was implemented because of politicians, but the scientists had the tests. The vaccine was developed in record time, um, which was really good. But then when you hear the story of how that vaccine was developed, particularly Moderna's and Pfizer's, you have to go back 20, 30, 40 years for the origins mm. of all of this. You know, Katie Carrico, who first had the idea that messenger RNA was going to make a good vaccine, um, she started this work a long time ago. She was heavily criticized for it. Nobody wanted to fund her. And now all of a sudden she's a hero. This is a really nice story to tell. And in my view, she and um, Drew Weissman definitely are candidates for the Nobel Prize. I mean, the work that they did many years ago laid 
the groundwork for Moderna and Pfizer to make these vaccines so quickly. And the nice thing about that is this was a new way of making vaccines. It's now been shown to work and we can use it everywhere. And mm. I think for a, a, a really good story to show the benefit of science, you couldn't wish for anything better. And it, res it, it brings a gut reaction because people are scared of COVID. People don't want to get it. They don't want their kids and their grandparents to get it. And so this is a nice story that I think if it's told well, will really do wonders for the, the reputation of scientists in the community. And this business about, you know, being uncertain, that's OK. Life is uncertain. Everybody who gets on a ski slope gets to the top and starts coming <laughs> down. You never know when you're going to have your accident. Skiing is an accident waiting to happen. But people understand that and they don't expect you to say, oh, you know, you're going to get to the bottom. Absolutely guarantee it every time. And so I think these kinds of analogies between science and the scientific method and that people's everyday experiences can be used very effectively if they're done well. Um, yeah, but that's, that's sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a passionate skier, but I'm, I'm glad I don't do probability assessments every time I go down the slope because you're absolutely right. Let, let me just give one, one quick, quick reflection on, on your point with, with Jacinda Ardner uh, in New Zealand. I mean, there are a few other leaders have also, I think, engaged with science in, in a very constructive way, exactly at, at this very special situation we are in, which is that science is advancing in real time, as you pointed out, Anna. And uh, another female leader is uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel in Germany, that I also think has, has been doing quite terrific in terms of, uh, you know, mobilizing the, the, the German academic tradition of debate, of open scientific debates. So, you know, bringing forward uh, the Robert Koch Institute, the Leopoldina Academy, the Charité University, all the scholars kind of battling it out in public and an outcomes in the end, the best balanced effort of, of guiding policy. While you see other countries where there's been this tendency towards relying on, on one voice, on one agency, on one institution. And, and I think um, there, there's something to be learned here also from, from this, uh, as you say, Rich, recognition of uncertainty, of complexity, and therefore you need to allow different scholars to, to kind of, uh, you know, that, that's how the scientific inquiry works. And, and I think that as well has been a lesson in, in, this, um, in this whole journey. Anna, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, no. It's, um, I, I, I'm thinking that, I was thinking exactly what you came to now, this lesson of, of having one voice, like Fauci then, who is really clear and he talks well and, and you, you understand his message and it's very good in communicating. Also, he has a lot of experience since he has been doing this for many years. And then having this, you know, multitude of different voices, as you said, Joan, to that you have a... a different angles from the scientific community coming with different results, trying to build this image uh, from different uh, directions, which makes a better probability that the image you, that you show is, is the right one or more, right, the more aligned to what is the reality. And that is something that is difficult when you talk about what to communicate. If, if, should you invite then four experts to the to the news uh, studio and to get this uh, multitude of angles or should you have people working in, in trying to say that now we're collecting different parts of this scientific field that we are the the the, the image that we see today is more probably this one like for you johan i'm, I'm, I'm like the parallel between the the covid and the the climate that that is something that you have been facing for a long time you have been working for many years with a picture that an image of the situation that has that is moving and changing and, and a lot of pieces that are added all the time from different researchers and still there are tensions within the fields between different scientific directions uh, and then to condense that into something that you can lift up to to policymakers or to the to the audience around you i think that is something that is really something interesting and, and I'm very interested to hear 
how you reason about that, Johan, also, because this is something that you know a lot about. No, thanks, Anna. This is a, this is a perfect segue to, to the next topic that was actually introduced by, by you, Rich, to discuss the, the, the challenges of communicating the climate crisis compared to the corona crisis. And, and I'll soon come back to you on, on your thoughts around slow and fast variables. But just immediately on, on your reflection there, Anna, that as, as a climate scientist, it has over the decades been probably what I could call the most frustrating experience that, uh, you know, society out there, particularly media, has been unable to recognize the fact that this is a, a scientific discipline that has been, you know, advancing for a century, laying evidence, piece of evidence, and piece of evidence, a piece of evidence on the physics, on the impacts, on the human caused physics and, and uh, processes to a point where it's, you know, equally well established as the fact that, you know, we have gravity and we know that uh, planet Earth circulates around the sun, but still media uh, loves to have the confrontation between a, a skeptic and a climate scientist, not recognizing that, you know, 98% of all scientists and all published research is, is on one side of the evidence, which is that human induced climate change is real, it's causing impacts, while it's a, it's a fraction of a fraction that is uh, claiming otherwise. And this, of course, is something we have in, in, in all domains in society. I mean, uh, uh, I, I would even support President Barack Obama where, where he said, look, we, we don't have time to listen to flat earth society because quite frankly, they have the same, let's say, justification of an argument, uh, kind of arguing that, that we're not even on a, on a, on a circular planet uh, as questioning human induced climate change. So this it's a it is it is frustrating, but I think we've rounded that corner since quite some time back. Not everywhere in the world, but in large parts of the world. But it is it is something that has has resulted in a in a slowdown in terms of action, no doubt, in my mind at least. But Rich, what are your thoughts here on on the difficulty of communicating the climate crisis compared to the corona crisis, which clearly has been uh, let's say a success in communication at least. Yeah, I think, you know, the difference is that because the coronavirus was something that hit very quickly, it was clear within a month or two that we had to do something about it. And so it became much easier for journalists, for politicians, for scientists to focus on this issue and then begin debating it, talking about it and going on. Climate on the other hand has been so slow and there have been vested interests opposed to doing something about climate change, namely money, um, through the oil companies, through the fossil fuel industry and so on. And I think we have to always remember that when you watch the news that, or read the newspapers, this is all being paid for by someone, usually by advertising. And so they don't want to do anything that would stop their advertising. And if mm. they come out strongly against stopping using oil, stopping using coal, they end up with a lot of financial problems. And I think we it's important that we recognize um, that this is a part of what's going on. And really, I, I always loved the BBC News because the BBC was supported not by lobbying, not by lobbyists, but by the government. And while mm. occasionally they were forced to be a little biased by the government. For the most part, they were fairly independent. And in fact, if you look now at Al Jazeera, they tend to do a much better job of being even um, the most media that we come across. And so I think this is important. The, the media needs to learn how to be effective in sending the messages out, how to be fair. Um, you know, they, they love a controversy, as you said. And so mm. they trend, tend to build on this. They, they want to have this. And if they become very biased one way or the other, then they go to the Fox TV network or MSNBC or, or somewhere else where their story will be told. And I think it's really important that we try to get away from this in terms of the general media. But of course, the worst of all at the moment is the social media. 
um, where there seems to be very little censorship of what goes on, and, and rather, if anything, the opposite, the, these wild conspiracy theories um, get broadcast very widely over social media. As soon as someone comes up with a good conspiracy about the government trying to do this or that or the other, that spreads like wildfire. And I think mm. this is something that is inherently quite dangerous and something it would be nice if we could find a good fix for. And I think in principle, the social media companies themselves could do something about this if they chose to, uh, but they too depend on advertising dollars. And so now we're back to this same problem that when you look at what problems we have around the earth, they all revolve around money, 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 money. Everybody is so focused on money, making money, how much money you have tells you what your worth is within society. Um, being a good human being doesn't matter so much anymore unless you've got a lot of money. So, you know, Bill Gates has got a lot of money because he made the sensible decision to marry Melinda and start giving it away. But, um, you know, I, I think, Anna, this is a, a, a good segue into you because women tend to do a lot better both in politics and philanthropy than men. Mm -hmm. Okay, I take that uh, <laughs> message. <laughs> but I, I'm thinking because this thing that you lift, uh, Rich, I think it's really an important issue of both the, the role of social media and the role of money, as you point out, that that both for the information and also what, what science is being done, because the science that is being done is where the money is. Researchers need to go where the money is in order to finance their their uh, their research. And, and that we could see now with the, the with the corona crisis that a lot of money was put into the to the um, to the science and the research about COVID-19 with with a with a way that I don't think ever has been seen and the amount of publications about COVID-19 I mean you count them in thousands every month uh, and it's impossible to to keep up with that and and in in some way that it's a little bit provocative if you see. I mean, if you go way back to the HIV crisis, or when 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 some people were 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 more dangerously harmed, or if you look at the climate crisis, uh, Johan, which I think somehow would be provocative for you as well, that that you have been talking about this crisis, but there is not this mobilization of money that is put in, and and then you see that it, it's possible to do it if you want to. Uh, but it's not being done if it if you're not forced to do it, and I think that is a very uh, interesting problem. And also that we ourselves are driving this because we are looking at content that tickles our this sense of um, controversies, uh, a good story, and, and then as you started by saying, Johan, that the, the the story of the climate change is really a drama. Uh, we should use these um, tools of the drama and the controversies in order to make it very intriguing mm. for people to to really get engaged. I don't know what you say, Joan, or if it's just um, loose ends. No, but I think I think the the, the drama is is key. Let, let me come to the drama just to tick off this money issue just because I it's something that that uh, I'm, I'm, I totally agree with you, Rich, and, and I'm so frustrated about this, but I think it's it's one of these perhaps unexpected, uh, deep, deep lessons of COVID-19, because as you may know, uh, we have been fighting and fighting and fighting for decades to mobilize funding to invest in, in a safe climate future, and particularly to enable developing countries to transition fast from, from dirty, fossil fuel based energy systems to renewable energy systems. And we have the Global Climate Fund, which is the mechanism to support that transition. And the aim is all countries have agreed 100 billion US dollars in the Global Climate Fund. It's been impossible to fill this with money. I mean, it's just been completely impossible. And it's been fighting and fighting and fighting. And then comes COVID-19 and overnight, we have 12 trillion US dollars on the table, 12,000 billion dollars. So suddenly, you know, 100 billion is like, it's like peanuts. It, it's, it's, just a, it's just a marginal error in the calculations. So I, I foresee that never more ever in humanity's existence on earth 
can we fight over climate funding anymore? Because it would be so pathetic. You know, how can we ever more fight over billions to, to, to save humanity's future on Earth when we were able to mobilize trillions to handle a, a, a health crisis, no doubt a disaster, but but still not existential. So, so I think that that's one thing that perhaps can help us. Who knows? It might be a little bit naive, but it's a hope that I have at least. Yeah, but then but on, I think there, is, there is hope <laughs> there is. for change. So if yes, you there look, is. There's a, a lot of philanthropists now have decided that climate change is a problem and, and that they want to put money in it. A lot of businessmen yeah. have decided that there is money to be made by supporting safer ways of gathering energy, solar energy, wind, and so on. And the the growth in these markets is starting to look quite good, but yeah. doesn't alter the fact that it's too late, that we should have been doing this 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, now that I think there are more people who realize that we have a problem, uh, but maybe it's too late to do something about it. Um, and so mitigation is, is the thing, instead of trying to avoid the problem, now we're hoping to mitigate and adapt to the problem. Uh, mm. But there is money heading into this direction. So I, I'm a little more optimistic now. But of course, COVID had the advantage that it was threatening to kill everybody. And, and people do worry a little bit about that when they think in a year <laughs> or two that they might die. No, you, you, you're so right. And, and in, in, I remember in preparing for this dialogue, how you emphasize that yeah, people react quickly when you're faced with the risk of dying abruptly. And it's so difficult to deal with uh, challenges that risk uh, potentially undermining lives of a future generations. That this kind of time lag is one of the climate crisis biggest difficulties. And that that is true. Uh, I mean, one of the most most challenging stories to tell today, scientific stories to tell today, I feel, is that we have more and more evidence that it's it's over the next 10, 20 years that we determine whether or not we press the on button of unstoppable change, but it's not as if we fall over a cliff. It's not like the economy will collapse like COVID or that people will die like COVID, but it's unstoppable. It means that in 200 years time, we have not one meter, but two meters, three meters sea level rise. We will have, you know, three billion people living in regions where heat waves are so bad that you can simply not, it's uninhabitable regions. You'll unstabilize large parts of uh, West Africa and the Middle East. So how to deal with this difficulty that it's like, it's COVID-19 every year in 100 years time rather than now. And, and as we know, Economics is not able to address this. Uh, uh, our, our, our risk perceptions are not able to deal with this. But it's part of the drama, I feel, Anna, that how to somehow build that into the narrative that, that we have to start seeing the drama in that and the moral responsibility that we cannot allow that those on buttons to be pushed. We have to take our responsibility now to avoid that happens down the down the line. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Anna or Rich, on how, how to best tell that story or what, what should we, it's almost suggesting a new way of measuring time, small thing. <laughs> but I, I think it's this, as we also talked about preparing that, that um, the, the, the issue of uh, painting the crisis situation or the possibilities uh, and solutions that is interesting in, in this storytelling. And I think also an important factor is if you look at all these young people that are going out now saying, listen to the science and now you, please step up. Uh, you, they know and you have to listen to them. Uh, and I think, I think it's very, very important that the story that we tell is not too dark, uh, not too alarmistic and not too negative. Uh, but also with hope and, and possibilities and solutions. If you can make that a nice story, of course, engaging mm -hmm. one. Uh, in order also for all our young people to feel hope uh, and to feel, especially for if, if we think that the, the problems of today will be solved by the laureates of tomorrow, we need the young people also to become scientists and to engage and to become researchers and to solve these problems. Uh, 
and they need to feel that it's worth and that it's that it's that they have a future that that they can con contribute to the solutions for uh, so I think it's it's a uh, I was so actually I was thinking about it Johan you said that even you sometimes have hard to find the good news and you sometimes read about the good news and you're like wow is it that good uh, mm -hmm. so so that it's 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 this thing of that we are not so interested in to l read the good news or the good stories as we are to the more frightening ones as rich was talking about these conspiracy theories that really are like intriguing and weird and, and oh, scary often so I, I don't know. I think it's a very, very tricky balance, but I think it's important that we think about also as as the role that we have as mediating knowledge and scientific results and, and research to lift all these possibilities. And that's I think is is the is the very lucky side of working with Nobel Prize programs because we have such a huge um, um, luggage to to pick stories about successful stories. Like the mm -hmm. one which, uh, like producing more food to humanity by using GMOs, for example, and 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 these good stories that, it, towards all beliefs, you could make it, and 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 also to make that more uh, realistic in a way that everyone can can um, go into this making the solutions. I don't know what you say. No, but you you you're so right, and and that takes us, so let's move towards uh, the, the strategies and practice. How can we improve science communication? And I think one part of that is clearly to to balance the story on on, on risk and, and solution. And, and just to, to share your point there, that, that it is actually true that when, when one summarizes the evidence on success, uh, even someone like myself who work with this every, every day, can be surprised, and and this was actually when working with Christiana Figueres, who uh, led the Paris climate negotiations. We developed something called the Exponential Roadmap, which was a communication on how are we doing on the transition towards renewable energy systems, and we and we collated all the information we had on solar voltaics and wind, and and to my surprise, you could see that over the last fifteen years globally wind and solar has doubled every 5.5 years. You know, just every 5.5 years doubling from a very low level. So it looks not very impressive at a curve. And that has often been the critique that, you know, renewable energy will never be significant in the global energy mix. But what surprised me was that if you just let that development continue, so basically what we could call business as usual, doubling every 5.5 years, it would mean that by 2030, in just 10 years time, 50%, half of the world's electricity would come from solar and wind. And that was like a, wow, you know, just continue as today, and we have half of all electricity in the world coming from solar and wind. Now, all empirical evidence knows that keeping up exponential curves is not easy, <laughs> but, but it is possible. And, and let me just anecdotally give you another little piece. I'm almost embarrassed over this. I mean, the most the most classic vehicle on planet Earth must be the London cabs. I mean, the, the black London cabs. And I talked to Nigel Topping just, just last week, you know, the champion for COP26 this year in Glasgow, appointed by Boris Johnson. And he just, just slipped out a statistic to me, said that, did you know that 30%, 330, 30%, of the London cabs are now electric? I said, what? Three zero? I thought perhaps three. I said, no, 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 30%. And uh, we're, we're forbidding them now. So, I mean, forbidding all the combustion engine cars. So they, <laughs> soon we're, we're, we're heading towards 100%. And these are the kind of stories that, that, of course, they don't reach fast to the world. So, Rich, how do we do that? How can we how can we get more effective in our science communication? Any any piece of advice from your side? Well, I, I think you know one of the things that that always goes down well on the news is a bad story, right? So, so they yeah, love yeah, yeah. things that are going wrong, and if they were to look beyond, at least in the U.S., beyond their own borders and in Europe, you can find plenty of examples of things that are going wrong because of climate change. Now, if you could imagine the news services trying to focus just a little bit on this, maybe spend a couple of minutes during a, a news broadcast 
to show what's going on in Bangladesh or what's going on in some of these island nations in the Pacific where sea level rise is causing problems. Go to Antarctica where glaciers are melting, go to the Arctic and so on. I think you could put together a, a relatively simple short documentary showing the problem, but then introduce this idea we can do something about it and talk about the London cabs. And so mm. this just juxtaposition in a short period of time, you know, you, you don't need a lot of time, you just need good visuals. This could raise awareness and actually sort of show the problem, make people um, sort of appeal to their moral character that, you know, this is not something that we should be doing, but here's the solution. So let's invest in this solution. And I, I think the new services could do a much better job uh, on this line. And it's the way they normally do business anyway, which is finding bad stories to tell. So they frighten everybody. And politicians could do the same thing. And I, I think this is something, this is an area um, where with some creativity coming in from the TV community, from the creative arts, you really might hope to do something, but raising awareness in a very visual manner, I think is always very helpful. You know, when I talk mm. about GMOs, I always compare the fancy restaurant in Paris with a beautifully decked out table um, mm. where they don't want GMOs. And then against a, a set of young children in Africa, who don't get enough to eat. And, you know, this raises the issue. Well, GMOs are a choice. You know, you don't have to have them. But if you don't want them, then just don't pretend they're dangerous. Don't tell these children in Africa that if they eat GMO foods, they're going to die. Uh, this, this is not the right message to be sending. And so uh, I think visuals can have a big impact. People can look at things and say, oh, yes, yeah, this is a problem. But don't you think also, I mean, you touched on that earlier also, that it's not only the content, it's also the messenger. And, yes. uh, and, you, and you are a very important messenger because you're a Nobel laureate. And uh, tell us a bit on what, what's your thought of, if I can put it as, 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 as hard and as follows, what responsibility do you as Nobel laureates have to help, to help <laughs> the world with better science communication? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that, you know, we're a mixed community. Um, you know, I always say if you think herding cats is difficult, herding <laughs> Nobel laureates is much more difficult. But I think the majority of them actually are really very decent people. And that when asked to help and asked to do something, they usually will. It was just until relatively recently, people haven't been asking them to do things. Mm -hmm. And so it's only those who felt a personal responsibility to get going and, and to try to help and that they got involved. And so, you know, I started off trying to herd these Nobel laureates towards good causes. Um, open access of the scientific literature was one of the first ones. And I found there were quite a few people who would join in. And as I'd gone on, I, I found more and more people willing to join um, these Nobel campaigns uh, to do good things. So at the moment, the pro-GMO campaign has 157 Nobel laureates signed on to it, all of whom um, look at the science and say, but, you know, GMOs are okay. There's no evidence that they're dangerous. And so it's mm. these kinds of things that I think can be helpful. But individual laureates who, they most of them have something they, they're passionate about. And when you find that, then they will stand up and help out and, and do what you want them to do. And I think this is something that the Nobel Foundation could help with even more than they do. So, you know, I like the, the new initiatives that they're taking, um, but they could do more. And most Nobel laureates, they, they want to help society. They're not bad people. They want to help society. Notes yeah. taken. And I just I just want to, to add here that Rich is a little bit modest here, but he's a really a, a, a laureate that has made a lot of uh, contribution of using his Nobel laureate uh, status to do fantastic things. And, uh, and I really would like you to share, Rich, uh, in this conversation, uh, what you did with the nurses in Libya, because I think it's also a beautiful picture of the... the what, what the Nobel Prize can actually do in terms of a very 
in a broader perspective than just communicating science? Well, yeah, I, I can tell you the story. So there was an outbreak of HIV in the children's hospital in Benghazi. And there were some more than 400 children were infected. And Gaddafi was looking for some scapegoat, someone to blame for this. And he started off blaming Mossad and that didn't work. And then he blamed five Bulgarian nurses and one Palestinian student and argued that they spread it deliberately. And they had a mock trial and they were sentenced to death. And um, when this first got going, I'd heard about it, but you know, the evidence was so flimsy and it seemed much more likely that it was just using dirty needles and sharing needles and spreading it around. Um, and I, it never occurred to me that this was going to get to a point where these nurses were going to be um, killed because of it. And so when I finally heard about that, I decided I should try and do something about it. And so I contacted uh, many of my Nobel friends, we had more than 100 who signed on. I talked to diplomats in London. Um, the Foreign Office have always been very good and they mobilized diplomats in um, Europe. I went to the Libyan embassy um, of the UN and talked to the ambassador. And about two weeks after that, I got a call from Libya saying, would I come to Tripoli and talk to um, Saif al-Islam, Gaddafi's son, about this issue? which I did. I got on a plane. I went over there. And the bottom line, the end to the story was that they were released. Um, they, they released these things. And it was just because the Nobel laureates got involved, raised awareness with the Libyans, but also raised awareness in the diplomatic community who previously were doing nothing really about this. And so, so we had a big effect. And I, I was rather pleased by this. This was, um, this was very good. The laureates can do things when, when they mobilize, when they organize. The peace laureates uh, occasionally get organized behind some really very good causes, and they've been quite effective too. I think it's fantastic what you did, Rich, really. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. No, but th this is, uh, I, I so fully agree, and it also shows the potential and uh, we have um, in the climate science community engaged with Nobel laureates over, I mean, even, even in the run up to uh, what was then the Copenhagen climate meeting and uh, which, which then led us to adopt the science-based target of keeping global warming below two degrees Celsius was actually a dialogue with Nobel laureates in a meeting that was hosted with Angela Merkel, Chancellor Angela Merkel in Germany, the, the first uh, Nobel laureate symposium on global sustainability, which was already in 2007. So I think there is a, a very nice, um, let's say we have proof that, that the Nobel laureate community around the world can, can play and many, as you say, Rich, play a very significant role in, in stepping up to uh, evidence-based, but also ethical engagements for, for humanities uh, future. And, and I think that just takes us to, to the last segment that I hoped we would tick off a, a few minutes, but in fact, we have, we've covered quite a lot of that. And, and my thought here was, so, so the, the grand challenge, of course, so, so what is the narrative, the scientific narrative, when we're talking about avoiding global environmental risks like climate change and biodiversity collapse, uh, and at the same time, being able to give hope to uh, future generations and, and, and peoples across the world. And uh, of course, the conversation here gives many of the elements there because you've been touching on, on, on the need to balance the scientific evidence of, of problems with the scientific evidence of solutions. And then I'm convinced per personally that just like you engaged in this uh, um, terrible threat to the nurses in Libya, I think today we have a rapidly emerging uh, narrative and therefore responsibility to engage also in, in the story of, of the drama, the drama of transitioning away from risks that we cannot manage and at the same time being able to fill that transition with, with such a positive story, the positive story of a better outcome for, for communities around the world. And the question to you is, how can we 
what what are what what could be ideas of of how to uh, uh, let's say standing on a on a theater stage and then trying to give a play with them often is a uh, is one very small experimental effort of that. But what do you have any other ideas? Any other advice? Uh, what what would you like to challenge anyone out there listening to this program of, of what what to do? So you're what asking you next. <laughs> I'm asking both of you. Please, Rich. Well, you know, my my feeling is that we all recognize that the future of Earth is in the hands of our children and our grandchildren. And I think the one thing that we really need to do is to make sure that we educate them properly, mm -hmm. because young minds are very open to new ideas. They're very curious about what's going on around them. Uh, but they also can argue logically. They don't have to listen to this nonsense that their elders are telling them all the time. Uh, I think, you know, people like Greta Thunberg, a wonderful example, the kids down in Florida who responded to the school massacre and became active. And um, I think we need to make sure the kids both have a good solid basis in understanding science and how science is done, but at the same time, encourage them to be activist in some way. Mm. And this is something they can start at home by taking the lessons they've learned in school, talking to their parents, their grandparents, other family members, friends. And in this way, I think if we can get a groundswell of movement from the youth of the country, uh, we would do much better. If you remember, the Vietnam War ended uh, because the students were upset mm. and they marched yeah. against it and they stopped. And kids can do anything. Uh, I, I think this idea that, you know, they can't do anything. I, one of the greatest experiences I had recently was I was talking to a class of 12 year olds about GMOs. And one of the, they'd all been told they had to write to me afterwards and say what they thought about the lecture. And there were about a dozen of them who wrote back and said, you know, this was the first time we've been spoken to as though we were adults. I think mm -hmm. this is a lesson for teachers everywhere. Yeah, no, very good advice. Thanks. Anna. Yeah, I, I am actually on the same line as Rich, even if you, we just talked about controversies are always more uh, nice for the an audience. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I think really our, our young people and the, and the role of education and actually that the young people can uh, educate the older people, what's all about, uh, what, is, what is happening? Because it, I feel also that the, the younger people have more information about what's going on now and, than many of their parents or grandparents. And as the example you said, Rich, about talking about things so your grandparents can understand. And I really believe in the force of the young people that they will be the 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 one who can ignite uh, in political actions as we have seen during the last couple of years how much this youth movement actually accomplished um, that that wasn't accomplished in years which is impressive so i think the role of education i think also the the interaction between nobel laureates and young people is amazing uh, and i've seen it in so many close in so many times and we have a big uh, uh, education uh, program at the Nobel Prize Museum and at, in the Nobel Prize uh, programs that is um, uh, also making Nobel Prize lessons in order to reach out to schools over the world to give materials to teachers to talk about the discoveries that are being made to use laureates as sources of inspiration and also talk about the laureates story uh, from when they were kids until becoming a laureate that can get, be very inspirational for young people and to the excess of laureates to the young people. For the laureates to talk directly to young people has an, a tremendous effect which is amazing to see. Even talking to people working with the Nobel Prize can sometimes be inspirational for young people. So using that power I think it's fantastic. That is something that I feel from what I can take on my part that doing even more for this is, is something that we can do who is working with the Nobel Prize uh, as a tool for uh, ins inspiration and information. Yes, here in Boston, we have a, a gentleman who's been organizing laureates in the Boston area. We have a, a large number in the Boston area to go out on school visits. Mm. They will go out and spend a, a morning at a school um, talking to the kids at a school. And 
you know, this is wonderful. Most laureates love talking to kids, mm -hmm. right? We go to meetings not to listen to all these old farts talking. We go to listen and meet with the kids and hear what they have to say. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is more of that that could be done for sure. Both kids and students at university is, yep. is, is good. Yeah. Was that the... I think this is... Uh... <laughs> No, that this is not 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 only inspiring and then good. I think it's also a, a a good moment to to round up this this very rich conversation. Time time is actually coming to an end, and and I kind of tick off on on, on my notes that uh, you are very clear in your message that uh, coming from science, coming so deep from science, and enrich you being sitting on the pedestal of the most respected scientist in the world, still opening for for passion for activism for engagement for creativity and i think that is also one one important message that we academics are not only in our lab digging in numbers we're also humans and and we are passionately engaged in in our own future on on this small little dear planet and i think that is in itself a kind of a hopeful message so Thank you so much for this, uh, uh, I, I hope, useful conversation for many. I mean, we walked through all the way from what's the role of science communication? What have we learned from COVID-19? What's the challenges with the climate crisis communication compared to the COVID crisis communication, but also practical steps on, on how one can engage much better with everything from media to kids and schools and, and how, you, how we must actually be better at, at communicating the action script of the drama and, and uh, the beneficial positive futures we can see. So with that, rounding up this um, very rich discussion, thanks uh, Sir Richard Roberts, Nobel laureate, and Anna Kvestrom Dorgi. It's been uh, terrific to have this uh, performance lecture conversation. Anyone uh, listening to this, please do. Have a look at our brief moment on Earth, the performance lecture, which is found on, on SVT Play, but also on uh, websites of, of the Dramaten Theatre and the Nobel Prize Museum. Uh, I would also like to encourage you to go there to, uh, you know, download uh, many of the other performance lectures. Uh, all of them are available there, and they are great, you know, experiences all the way through. So, with that, um, we thank you so much, and um, yeah. Keep keep science flag high. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.